Never we works. do. We always try to screw you up. Well, anyway, it doesn't work. Hey, good morning, hey, everyone. We're live. Welcome. While Chuck and Scott are trying to screw me up on my intro, it's not going to work. Um, welcome, everybody, to the next, this uh, recent episode of Keystroke Medium. It is season three, episode 17. Uh, I am Josh Hayes here with Chuck Manley and Scott Moon. And our guest today is uh, Yunahanjaya, Yunahanjaya VJ Ratna. Which uh, I, I probably got like almost almost correct. Uh, but we're um, he would answer you are, if you said that in the crowd. He would turn around and go, "Who's butchering yeah. my name? Who, <laughs> who just said that? And who needs punched in the face for not being able to pronounce?" Uh, so it's going to be a great show today for everybody that's uh, tuning in. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us today, uh, Yuna. Thanks for taking some time out of your day. I know it's what is it 11 11 p.m there in uh in sri lanka so thanks for staying up and and spending wow. some time with us today hey thank you for having me and, and apparently it's super hot there oh god yes it's boiling <laughs> <laughs> I, I i told him it was only about 60 degrees here in in kansas and he said ah it's by <sighs> by fahrenheit scales it's like 98 degrees there in sri lanka yeah. so that's 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 rough. That's way out at my outer mm. limit of being not complaining. It's a big bucket of nope. I would complain a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a big, a big yeah. bucket of nope. Yeah, and it's only get it's only going to get hotter. Like the oh good the season, hot season is barely just starting. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, you know I always you get to a point in the winter time when you're like you know I, I'm really done with the winter I I just like it to be warm again and then yeah. you get to the summertime in about August oh. yeah and you're like and you're like I am so done with the hot weather I am ready for winter time and it's just this vicious cycle of yeah. I don't like the weather that I'm in right never and we happy. get like we get two never and a half satisfied. days of spring two and a half days of spring and then a, a day and a quarter of fall and then all the rest is like extreme temperatures it's very dumb oh, yeah. i don't like oh, it at all. you guys are lucky though you guys have you guys actually have seasons we don't yeah. we just we have like nine months of blazing heat and then it rains for a while and then there's floods and then somebody drowns and then we go back <laughs> <laughs> there's so, like an annual drowning tribute that they have to get right <laughs> everybody <laughs> <knows>. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Hot rain drown. Hot rain drown. We it's like a, we usually have all like four a, seasons. Is, that, is, it, the is it like a ritual here. sacrifice that that's what gets the rains to stop? Is just the you ritually drown someone and the rains just dry up? Well, and, and well, this is the stuff that I can't make up, right? Uh, so we have uh, the rain. The rain stop. We have a drought season. And our country is sort of like for about 2000 years, we've been pretty good at this irrigation business. And apparently we've been doing it ever since the Egyptians were building pyramids and so on. Um, our president, I, uh, I think last year's drought season took it into his heads, or his head rather, to uh, pray to the rain gods with a bunch of rice farmers. Um, I have no idea why. Apparently he's not living in the same century as we are. But yes. <laughs> Uh, you're not too far off the mark there. Oh my gosh! Okay, oh, yeah. I was joking, but hey, yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah. works. You don't I mean, ever you... joke about ritual sacrifice. I guess not. Yeah. And what can I say? I go to dark uh, we'll start. We'll start having a ritual sacrifice on this show, and it'll be all your fault. <laughs> yeah. Once you start, hey, once you start down that road, you can never go back. Yeah, yeah. I'd sign up to watch that. Except we uh, will do like ritual burning alive and not drownings because that's way more painful and gruesome and entertaining. Probably. Immolation, it's much more colorful and you know. I active. think we should get with the times and it should be like a, a ritual Snapchatting to death or something. That's cruel uh, and unusual. I think that's yeah, illegal. It really is. That's, that's pretty rough. We may have gone too far with that. Death by yeah. Facebook. All uh, right. A snap, Snapchat so of the like. To <laughs> Book smokes. We're talking about Snapchatting. <laughs> Get some important stuff going on here. So, uh, uh, the reason that uh, Yuda came up on our, our radar is 
uh, last year he got picked up by Harper Collins for his uh, Commonwealth Empires trilogy, uh, and his book contract is now up to five books with uh, Harper Collins, and he's the first Sri Lankan author to get a five book deal, which is very neat. Uh, one of the novels includes his uh, novel Numbercast, which we'll talk about. It's got a, a really exciting premise and actually uh, kind of a scary uh, prediction. Um, of things that are going on in the world, and then a nonfiction book that focuses kind of on big data and what governments use it for. Uh, but he started writing in 2017, um, and so I'm really interested to see how you go, how you went from. I think a lot of people when they 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 watch the show or they look at other authors and and they people go from indie to traditional, and they're they're wondering how to make that leap, and it, it seems like you made that leap very quickly. Um, so would you tell us just a little bit about yourself, uh, just to kick us off here and then, uh, tell us how you got started in writing. All right. Um, I am a, a, what most people would call a data scientist. Um, uh, we just call ourselves researchers, uh, which is like a very fancy way of saying I sit in front of a computer and I sit and think for a living. And, uh, my job is mostly analyzing, uh, large data sets think along the lines of what Cambridge Analytica might do if they were good. But what we do is we use uh, humongous amounts of data obtained ethically uh, to help governments. That's the key. Right? Not, yeah, we, we do hard research and then we try and push governments around and say, look, stop stop being idiots and you know do good by the people. So we are a nonprofit. Means we don't make a lot of money, but it's fun work. It's, the amount of data we have is insane. Uh, I started writing somewhere around uh, 2015. I was a tech reporter back then. I was uh, running Sri Lanka's first uh, tech news network. And I was at this meeting where you have entrepreneurs and you have investors coming together. And every so often you invite to these meetings. And it's dreadfully boring. You know, the, half the guys are trying to sell bullshit and the other guys are basically trying to invest in bullshit. And uh, <laughs> you, I, 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 you know, it was funny because every time you would have one of these guys and an investor come along, they'd talk to each other. And they'd ask, they try to suss uh, where each of, you know, the other person falls on the power hierarchy. You know, how important is this guy? How much money does this guy have? And then they would walk away. So I kept thinking it would be so much easier if there were numbers on top of your head showing exactly how much influence you have, which is not, a, not exactly a new idea. But I was, uh, but then about a few months later, I joined this company called WS2. And some of the stuff that I was working, I was working with the big data team. We were, for example, analyzing about a million tweets a day. And I was working with some clients that were doing some very interesting things with credit scoring. And I thought, OK, if you can take this, and if you can take some of this, the social media scoring components, you can put that together into a universal human index. So you take the Times um, top 100 people as the 100 most influential people on Earth. And you look at who they hang out with, who do they, who do they tag, who listens to them. And that's the second layer. And who do those people talk to? That's the third layer. And Facebook research shows that by 2014, the world had only 3.1 to something degrees of separation. So you to me, to the Queen of England, there's only like three people in the chain. Actually, that, yeah, that's, 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 so that's so much that's potential. So much potential. Yeah. So I, I basically said, OK, so here is this number. And what it's going to create is this algorithmically enforced caste system, which is which has always been like a big part of societies like ours in South Asia. And what you get is the people at the bottom. Uh, they are going to inherit the social networks that their parents have and that the people around them have, and they're forever going to be trapped there. So you you go to the bank and um, you ask for a loan, and the, they'll ask, okay, what's your number? You tell them, and you say, okay, okay, that, that's here's your loan. Five years later, you might go down to the club, and the bouncer will say, I'm sorry, I can't let you in. You're just a 5K. These guys in here, 8K. I'm sorry, that's not going to work. And 10 years down the line, you try to buy an apartment, you try to put your son to school and the answer is sorry you're not important enough you don't have enough online influence you don't reach enough people and yeah. this happens yeah. the world is segregated this way but it's among very invisible lines so i wrote this and then i put it out on amazon and uh, then everyone was suddenly talking about what china is doing this sesame credit system and i had written that in the book because i had been following what china was doing for years and I actually had taken both the Chinese system and this sort of decentralized, more market-oriented capitalist system to extremes and written that there. And then this sort of took off. That's brilliant, man. 
That is absolutely brilliant. So it's 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 cool because um, that seems to be kind of like a growing trend anyway. Like you look and see like how many friends do you have on Facebook, and you're like, oh, I have more friends than this other person does. And yep. um, Black Mirror did actually um, uh, an episode of some something along those lines where it's, uh, they yes. had. They had a, um, I can't remember what the score was called, but it was basically uh, like. There was this girl who was trying to buy a house or something. She had to have enough mm -hmm. reputation on the net, and people would just right. swipe and yeah. rate her up. And she ended up getting downrated. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't due to, uh, it wasn't due to like a credit, like a, like a government run credit score. It was like people yeah. could actually, like, they could select you. Uh, on yeah. their phone select you and then give you a bad score and that would change your average and if yeah. you weren't like an average of three and a half you couldn't get like a certain loan and yeah. so she she kept trying to like up her grade by getting all these up uh, uppity people to give her a better score and then it all crashes and burns and uh yeah absolutely what show is that this it's, is like uh, Black Black Mirror. So Black Mirror is a is is just a series of short stories. It's like an anthology, and basically the whole show takes little bits of technology and then sees what happens when you play around badly like with it, like blow it out and make it. A yeah, big, and, it, and is the, this yeah. on Netflix or something? It's, it's, really it's on good. Netflix. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Cool. Check it out. I think it's some of the finest speculative fiction out there. Honestly. Oh, I agree, and I've watched I've watched almost all the episodes. None of them connect, so it's not a series. They're all it's like a Twilight stories. Zone kind of thing, where every episode is yeah. its own little standing story. Yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. Uh, PKD's Electric Dreams, where everything is its own standalone story. Yeah. Yes, exactly yeah. like that. Yeah, I've never heard of it. It's a, it it took me a couple episodes to actually get kind of get in there because I was expecting a series. I didn't understand that it was an anthology. So when I actually when I got into it and, and figured out that it was an anthology, I was like, oh okay, that's pretty nice. So um so talking about number cast and that was your de debut novel and then uh kind of moving forward into the uh Empire um Commonwealth Empires trilogy. Yeah um so it, writing that that's what originally got picked up by Harper Collins, right? That trilogy. Yeah, um, so Numbercast was deemed unsuitable for publication by uh, local publishing houses here. Uh, they pointed out that science fiction has never been, never sold in this country, basically. And they're like, well, I, I, it's a nice story, but, you know, uh, it's science fiction. And at that point, I was like, well, screw it. Uh, but after that was out, I got headhunted by an agent, basically. And um, I started posting these snippets of what I was writing to my Facebook. And as I was writing this, the first of the Commonwealth uh, Empires novel, I was, I was thinking, uh, okay, so if 1914, uh, the First World War had never happened, at the time, the heads of state of Europe were basically just first cousins. So it was a family war that grew out of control. And if that uh, Archduke Ferdinand doesn't get assassinated, Okay, Britain doesn't go to war, it holds on to its military might, puts down the American rebellion, hangs on to the Commonwealth. Uh, you have the Germanic Federation of States, you have Tsarist Russia there because no communism. And you have China under the Song Emperor, you have little Ceylon here where Chinese and British trading interests meet. And I was just tossing this stuff out on the Facebook. And uh, this agent got in touch with me uh, and said, well, I want to see what you have. Well, some people have been talking about it because by that time, Numbercast is getting reviews in like the Huffington Post. Uh, it was being talked about uh, in some Indian newspapers as well. So there was a certain amount of attention there. And uh, this guy contacted me and said, uh, okay, I want to see what you have. So I said, like an idiot, I said, okay, I'll deliver my first draft to you by December of that year. Uh, <laughs> and and then I, I had just written, like I had written half the book. And I was basically organizing the Arthur C. Clarke Centennial here because Arthur Sir Arthur lived here in Sri Lanka. That was when yeah. he died. Yeah. Uh, so we, we were putting together a centennial for the man and uh, it being his 100th birthday. And uh, uh, my deadline was that night. And once the event was over and we had sort of packed up the drink cases and thrown out all the food, I realized, well, I have another fifteen to 20,000 words to write on this. So I sort of strapped myself in and literally wrote the whole thing <laughs> out sitting there. 
uh, and sent it to this guy and thought, okay, you know, that's that's my chance completely gone. But they loved it. This guy wrote back and said, uh, yeah, I like it. My editor likes it. Uh, can you make these small changes? Like, can you expand this chapter? A bit? I, can, I said, okay, I can do that. Did that, said it. He said, uh, Harper, Amazon, and Penguin Random House are bidding for it. Wow. Bidding yeah. so nice. Two of them offered really large, uh, I mean, compatibly large sums. Uh, but Harper was the one that offered the most amount of longevity because I made it made a point to say that this is technically a world where I can you know, continue to write for a long time. There are lots of themes here that I want to explore. And they picked up on that. That's so cool. I took the longest time. That's impressive, actually. To, uh, I mean, for, for normal normal people getting into traditional publishing, and sometimes it's even it's hard enough just to find an agent. I mean, when you're much less get a bidding war going. Much, yeah. yeah, exactly. Much less get a bidding war for three major publishers. I mean, Amazon and Harper Collins, and and what was the other one you said? Random Random House. R Random oh, House. Yes. Yeah, so the top, pretty much the top three yeah, publishers I mean, are, are bidding for your stuff. That's. That's very impressive just to do off of a basically a, a large synopsis or an outline. That's very, it that's should, very crazy to me. It shows the advantage of having a, a big concept or a high concept type of idea. Right. Yeah. Not I think small. it was also, I mean, much as I would love to take all the credit for that, I think it was also um, an effect of Facebook, the whole, you know, drawing us closer together thing. And the fact that I was connect, I was connected to a lot of people around these people. Because I knew a lot of the authors from Sri Lanka, the people that these guys had published. Um, and I had sort of, not that I started out as a social creature and thing, but I would meet these people every so often uh, when they come down here, sort of bump into them, and sort of have them added on Facebook. Very intelligent people to talk to it. And I sort of knew not the deal makers themselves, but a few people around the deal makers. And I think right. what they were saying at the time also had a huge impact in me getting that. Well, first, congratulations because that's uh, that's damn near unheard of for uh, uh, a, a bidding war to come off of. Uh, I mean, it's not your debut novel, but it's it's pretty much your debut traditional published novel. So that's that's awesome. I, I mean, I, I I think any author would would love to have that that story to tell. What's it like working with the deadlines with a traditional versus having more control? Oh, it's it's a lot easier. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, because I mean, they think that you need to take a long time to write a book. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whereas if anyone has hung around the 20 books to 50K group long enough, you'll know that that's not true. Right. So, <laughs> right. Is, like, you know, I, back to us in two years with your final draft. Okay, I think I can squeak yeah, it in by I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, 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 I work. I take a couple of days off a month and I essentially sit back and write about 12,000 words a day. And, and you know, I have, I have massive deadlines sit on, but um, they did require a lot of, like I did have to send them like a hundred covers from, of science fiction from the golden age to now handpicked for themes and uh, art styles mm -hmm. and everything. Because uh, for example, when I first talked to them, uh, some someone from the marketing team had decided that a Marguerite painting would be a good cover for Numbercast, and this is a painting which has uh, essentially a man in a suit with an apple in front of his face. I think it's from 1945 or something. And I kept going, no, that's not going to work. You know, the people are not going to pick up a cyberpunk slash dystopian novel of a Marguerite painting. So they're used to pushing literary fiction. So I sort of had to uh, talk about the genre and sort of get them up to speed on that. But otherwise, it's been wonderful. So we have a, a question from the, the live audience that are watching right now. Richard Fox would like to know if you ever had the chance to meet uh, Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke when he lived there. Yes. In Long. yes I did. Oh, hey, Richard. I'm a huge fan of his books, by the way. Uh, I did get to meet uh, Sir Arthur. Uh, there is, there's a place called the Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Astronomy. It's right next to the Moto University. And when I was a kid, we were taken up there, did this astronomy course, and I got to see Saturn. He's the largest, through the largest telescope in Sri Lanka. And Sir Arthur was there. So he was in his wheelchair, mind you, and he didn't, he didn't uh, talk much. I think he was on his last legs at the time. But he did, he did sort of roll up and spend some time looking at the sky. And he just turned to us and said, 
you know, we are going to end up going there someday. <laughs> Excellent. And, yeah, and you know what? We were kids. We didn't understand it. We knew this was a great man, but we knew of his greatness uh, by watching how other people reacted to him and how people like from diplomats to politicians hung on his every word, right? When we just sort of nodded like idiots and we walked. And we said, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then years later, you're like, oh, I should have said that. It would have been great to like, say oh, that. Oh, there yeah. is an Spanish yeah. 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 selfie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, I grew up reading R.C. Clark books. Uh, Rama was probably the first sci-fi book that I touched. And you sort of never forget that. So. I, I hear that there somebody was actually looking at i think of making a series out of rama i can't remember who it was but I, I i remember hearing talk uh maybe it was late last year somebody looking it might not even have been in development but looking looking to make the the rendezvous the rama series into like a like an hbo series or showtime i remember or that yeah i remember reading something somebody was trying to do a treatment for that because i know they, they did they did the oh, childhood's end yeah. thing this was yeah. morgan Freeman. It was what? This was Morgan Freeman. He was. Oh, he's talking about that. Yes. Yes. Oh, interesting. Oh, that'd be nice. I could watch Morgan Freeman all day long. He could just talk. I need yeah. to get Morgan Freeman to read one of my books. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, uh, moving into so the number cast book is is uh, is uh, science fiction kind of present day uh kind of techie and then you mentioned that uh the commonwealth empires it, it starts out kind of alternate history uh, but it's but it's also kind of like a a cyber uh punk ish type um universe so can you talk about a, a little bit about that and how how because you say what is it 2030 ish is where you you said yeah, it it's, and so it's 2033 and uh so my initial premise was we happen to have between India, between uh, off the coast of Goa and between Sri Lanka, we happen to have uh, huge reserves of thorium, which is by some, I mean, I'm a huge fan of it myself, uh, is put forth as the fuel of the future. We have enough, I think, on this planet uh, to run the earth for the next 500 years or so. 2% of the radioactive active waste of uranium and uh, China is trying to build thorium reactor. They have plans to have thorium reactors in the power grid by, I think, 2035, and so does India. And uh, in the 60s or 70s, when when the atomic bomb testing uh, was taking place and when the nuclear energy programs were being refined, they did try thorium, and they concluded that it could not be used because it could not be weaponized. <laughs> so we, I mean, we, yeah, <laughs> so we are, I mean, so what I said, what I thought was, uh, like my country was essentially conquered by the British, uh, and th there are a lot of systems in place that are still what they left us, which including they left us with the seeds for a 30-year civil war. We finished that in 2009 or so. Uh, I drew on a lot of that, and I exerted everything in 2033. So Britain has Sri Lanka because of thorium. Britain has India because of thorium. It's a, this huge energy nexus. Uh, you have, and Sri Lanka is where Chinese and British trade interests meet. Uh, the Chinese have Australia. That's basically a Chinese colony. And, nice. and you have, uh, and, and Ceylon, Ceylon, as they call it, essentially becomes the source of proxy war between the British and the Chinese empires. And that's, that's, what the, that's what the series is about. The start of the proxy war, how it's triggered. It's actually triggered by... Uh, a civilization of bots that emerge. Uh, kind of like an or, AI? Sort of, sort of. What's happened is there are, so this this particular cabal in, in, in Kandy, there's this ruined city called Colombo there, and they have you started using bots as reality team. You know, put them together, make them as human-like as possible, let them, give them the instinct to form tribes automatically, and let them fight. It's a lot like uh, uh, Lord of the Flies out there. It's televised, and right. people have great fun watching it. Unfortunately, uh, well, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck and it also thinks like a duck, maybe it is a duck. Yeah, what could possibly <laughs> go wrong? I mean, right. yeah, <laughs> right. And eventually, by purely by mimicking 
uh, these bots acquire enough behavior. We don't know if they're sentient or not, or if they're self-aware or not. They acquire enough behaviors to start acting surprisingly human, including reacting when threatened, including uh, turning on humans. And they are essentially the, the whole plot of this uh, reality TV revolves around these tribes going to war with each other. So they're already really good at sticking pointy objects into other things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> <Unfortunately, laughs> Somebody's getting sacked for that. <laughs> yeah, so they happen to have Chinese assets, and that's that seen as a uh, since since this is technically a British property, that's seen as an action of war. And lo and behold, Britain and China go to war. With this. I like I like that they stick pointy things into things. Um, <laughs> yeah, whenever you get robots on a homicidal rampage, you know that there's going to be problems. I've, right. I've been oh, yeah. saying this for years. Oh, yeah. yeah, the other uh, you know thing we have we haven't maybe gone into with that scenario is I'd like to see what a Chinese Australian accent sounds like. You know, hundred years. Ago, <laughs> I'm sure it'd be epic. Oh, no, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't have the Australians at all there. Yeah, well, it'd be Chinese. Australians. You wouldn't. Have, yeah, you just have uh, the Chinese, right. slightly, right. extremely sunburned Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, in your research to create this universe, uh, so I'm always curious because w when I create universes, most of the most of the stuff that I create is either a really really far in the future, so a lot of the stuff yeah. is removed from Earth or it's fantasy and it doesn't have anything to do with Earth. So in this kind of alternate timeline for Earth, how did you sit down doing the research for where countries would? kind of migrate to like so for instance China taking over in Australia did you do a lot of research into like did, yeah. did your data did your your data mining stuff come into play there where you're looking at not, not my data stuff as such but uh, among the people that I work with I mean we are a multidisciplinary team we have economists we have sociologists we have historians we have data scientists uh, we have AI guys I mean we we run quite a lot of machine learning tools ourselves uh, so I essentially started going through the history books, trying to figure out uh, political splits and where they might most likely occur. And, and then I tried figuring out the geopolitics around it. I spoke to historians, I put together the maps, and then I started researching uh, the mechanics of British conquest, how they actually divided empires, how they fought battle tactics, the whole nine yards. So my, my stuff is innately research and grounded. And, uh, this is where it's experimental because it's always that uh, what I keep trying to do is put in that philosophical hook. Like the first book is, uh, have you heard about the Chinese box? You, you yeah. know the Chinese box problem, right? So, so imagine you and I talking here and there is a box somewhere in the corner of your room and there's a person in it. Uh, that person, say, he speaks Chinese, a native Chinese speaker. And inside the walls of this box, this is a very simplified description, but inside the walls of this box are a series of instructions for the encoding English into Chinese and vice versa. Now, you and I will have a conversation in English and we'll say, okay, we should tell that guy too. And we'll write it down in English and we'll slip it under the door. And he'll look that up. He'll turn that back into Chinese. He'll think his thoughts, turn them back into English and slip it out to us. Now, to us, for all points and purposes, the person in that box is a perfect native English speaker. We have no idea as to the actual process that goes on inside because all we see is the input and output. So right. I drew on that and I said, okay, even when sentience and self-awareness evolve, we are not really going to know what it looks like because to us, it's just a series of inputs and outputs. It's, it's a system doing what it's supposed to be doing. We don't really understand the process going on there. Oh, and this is exactly right. what happens with our machine learning algorithms, the stuff that I train, for example, where you can train it on a data set, you can give it, say, 100,000 images and say, okay, this is, this is some stuff that's being classified. You figure out the rules for doing this and you have to work on this million, uh, you have to work on these million images or whatever. It will figure out the rules for figuring out what humans look like, what cars look like, how to monitor traffic, everything. But we don't really know what's going on there. We absolutely have no idea. Right. We built books that works. Wow. Wow. I, no, I really, that's, that's a very cool description of, uh, of how we would interact because you, you kind of, um, you always have the uh, thought in the back of your mind when you're talking about AI and it's either going to be like Skynet or, uh, like something else, but you don't ever really kind of 
sit down and think about how how they would evolve and how we right. would see them evolve because you wouldn't really see them come out. You they and they the would thing just is the, the software engineering industry is iterating, right? It rarely has a great leap forward. So yeah. what I think on a scale of self awareness, say you have an earthworm here, a cat and a human. Uh, we will go from say earthworm like levels of self awareness to cat like levels, dog like levels, and eventually to human like levels. But there is that point in between these where it's intelligent, it might form its own threat threat response models, it might form its own reactions, but we just don't recognize it in the same way that we can't really communicate with the dog. We have very limited vocabulary for understanding each other. And we're gonna hit that phase. I don't yeah. think I think we'll get there long before we get to Skynet. And then what we do to that creature and how we treat that will determine whether we end up with a benevolent AI or Skynet. Well, I mean, uh, as a as a human race, we have such a great track record of dealing positively with things <laughs> that are new right. that we don't understand. Yeah. So I don't see any issues there at all. No, we never mistreat anyone. <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, I, I want to take just a minute to uh, talk about the show sponsor this week, and then we'll dive right back into the conversation here. Uh, this week's uh, show sponsor is Message for the Dead. It's the eighth book in the Galactic uh, Galaxy's Edge series by uh, Nicole and Jason Onspock. Message for the Dead. As Legion, uh, Commander Keller attempts to coax the Republican Black Fleet into a winner-take-all battle at the heart of the Galactic Core, Wraith uncovers secrets from Tyrex, Tyrus Rex's past determined to liberate his crew from the clutches of a dormant fleet controlled by a hostile AI. Speaking of the soldier turned rogue comes face to face with the galaxy's greatest threat. Meanwhile, Chun and kill team victory find themselves taking on new roles inside the Legion and the fight for control of the galactic Republic hits its Zenith with the arrival of the malevolent Cybar. That is uh, available, I think, for pre-order right now. Uh, it's going to be released here in a few days. I've got the link. We're going to once again see if it works in the live chat. If it doesn't, then uh, that's Google's fault and not my fault. Uh, but if it does, if it does not work, then you can always find it on Amazon. You can search Legionnaire or just uh, Message for the Dead, and you'll find it. It is on pre-order. It releases on Wednesday, so uh, April twenty-fifth. It comes out. You can pre-order it now for four ninety-nine. And uh, I use this as a show sponsor because yesterday I finished my first draft of Strikers War, which is um, one of the books in their Order of the Centurion series that they've got uh, me and J.R. Hanley, Jonathan Yanez, Richard Fox, uh, Karen Travis is uh, writing in that yeah, series as well. It's, nice. basic, it's basically like, um, so it's... Um, the Order of the Centurion is basically stories of Legionnaires doing really cool things. Um, there are some tie-ins to the main storyline that they have, but they're they're not necessarily connected. So uh, I just turned in my first draft yesterday after a five hours of sitting in front of the computer fixing stuff for the the final final uh, stretch. Did you write twenty thousand so, words? And no, no, I did not. I actually, I think I only wrote like. I probably only wrote like 1800 and I deleted several uh, hundred while I was going through. The funny thing is when I go through and I, I do my word counts for the day, I don't delete. I strike through. And then but at the end of the day, when I write my total down, then I go back and record. I go back and delete all the strike throughs. So I'm going through and I'm writing and I've got I hit my my word count that I know I needed. And I go back for a total for the novel and I go back and I start looking through and there's literally like 2000 words worth of strike through text that I didn't delete. And so I deleted them. I'm like, Oh my God. Oh no. So, but anyway, back to, uh, back to Yuda and his books. Um, I'll, I'll, a lot of times on the second half of the show, we like to talk about uh, uh, process and, and the business of writing. And um, we've touched a little bit on it so far. Um, and, and you mentioned it too, kind of the difference in, in production schedules that you look at when you're either indie or traditional, which is interesting to me because you look at some traditional authors uh, and they take, you know, one or two years to come out uh, with a novel. And that's, that's very usual. It's, 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 it's generally accepted a lot of them write pen names so they can produce more. I know Dean Koontz had several yeah. pen names because they said you can only publish this many books and he writes right. super fast. And so he has yeah. like 
and and this even happened to Stephen King, right? Which is why he started writing as Richard Bachman. Richard Bachman, right, yeah. right, right. And I think now they just let him do whatever he wants. Yeah, uh, which, which, which I, I'd stop. love. To, I'd I'd love to get that. I, I'm just gonna put my name on it, and you just give me a check, okay? And right. the end, there's just gonna be AI computers and Stephen King, and that's <laughs> all this life for society. So run that through your filter a couple of times, see what. Happens. And the great thing about that is the ending will suck. That's, <laughs> a, that's, a, that's a king reference yeah. uh, so uh, so tell us a little bit about uh how your process works uh yuda and um i know you still write at an indie pace um but but kind of tell us how your process works and and um and how you go on developing your your novel um so i spend about um so i'm used to reading large amounts of research papers like things I do that for a living. Uh, so I spend about a month on research, uh, on sort of constructing the, the the rules of the world, basically the background, the texture, everything. And then I write once a week, once or twice a week, if possible. Uh, when I do write, I end up going on straight for 10 to 12,000 words, and that's usual. How many? And wow. 12,000? 12,000? Yeah. yeah. So I don't. I, I, uh, I mean, I sleep once in every about three days or so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's doable. Yeah, it's, You'd be well suited for space travel when we start exploring the stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm also slightly so probably not. And I'm not the most physically fit person out there. So maybe not. But, uh, but my process is generally I try to figure out uh, what the grand, what the background of, of the whole thing is. And then I try to populate that in characters. Uh, I rarely, I rarely go. Okay, this is what's going to happen in this chapter. This is what's going to happen in this chapter. But I have a series of images in my head. That here's what's happening. Here's what's happening in the beginning. Here's what's happening in the end. And here's what's happening in the middle. And I sort of connect the two. And I drop characters in there and try to let them figure out what they want to do. And occasionally, yeah, I, I basically just guide them from point A to point. And I have no more than four to five. Keystone scenes like this in whatever I write. Just let them do their thing. It's mostly so about it's filling. It's most about what? It's mostly about filling in the background texture because if I have the background right, like if if that world feels com complex and rich enough, then my characters sort of do their own thing. But if it falls flat, and I've tried to, and this has fallen flat as well, then nothing happens. Nothing sparks. Like after the first fifty pages, the whole thing just falls apart. It's uh, it's interesting to me that you mentioned uh, when when we first talked about your deal, you you had to get basically a, a synopsis or an outline, uh, kind of an idea to your agent. Oh, to, no, I, wrote, to what... I wrote the whole book. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, I, I I, 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 I'm sorry. I, 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 for... I like a fifty-five thousand word thing. I got you. I was a, I, I guess I interpreted it as you 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 sent in a, like a really detailed outline. So that that makes a little bit more sense now that did you submitted a complete book? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you don't plot and you just have these major scenes. Do you write? So some people write backwards from they have the major scene and they write backwards to get to where they need to go. How do you how do you connect the dots and keep it uh, correct without having a lot of going back and fixing things? So I don't exact, I don't exactly work backwards, but. Like I said, like for me, the background essentially are the events that are outside the character. Uh, mm. Say, for example, in the storyline of Number Past, you have these things happening. You have the huge fight that Number Corp has with Facebook over data, and you have this winning. You have the huge clash with the Indian government, and all of these things happen. And it's basically for me, it's a process of figuring out how the character, the character's reactions to that, and how they drive that forward. I don't really work backwards, but I think that I do plot at some level. Uh, because when I started right shortly after I published Numbercast, I realized that I don't have an MFA or, or you know a literary arts background or anything of the sort. So I thought, okay, so I should probably give myself an education on this. So I uh, realized that people have been analyzing story and plot for a couple of thousand years now, and it started with uh, with the poetics, basically. Yeah. Plato's poetics, where he went and he basically, you know, uh, set down three act structure that's present in drama today. And I went from I studied everything from that to Joseph Campbell's uh, The Hero, 
uh, the hero's journey where you have all 17 stages and Google's editions thereof. And I think at some level I do a roughly Shakespearean plot structure. I think that's sort of built into me where you have uh, the rising, you have the rising climax, you have that peak, you have something rising and then you have uh, you have this sort of explosion happening and then you have a long, long curve that wraps up all the plot threads. I think there is a plotting process there. Because I don't, I don't entirely think I'm bringing it blind. I did that for number cast, and that took me two and a half years to finish that book. And then the next book came out in like a month. Did ah. you have? There you go. Now, is this writing process you're using? Did you, is this where you started, or that develop over time? That's the best for you. Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, I think it's a sort of bastardized system cobbled together of whatever I've read and whatever I really clicked with. I think okay. there's. You know, uh, quite a lot of similarities to William Gibson's novels, for example. Uh, and I think it's just sort of fixed itself in my head, and that's, that's what I'm using at the moment. And I occasionally use to short stories to see, to try and break out of that and see if I can do something different. And if I can, to incorporate in that. So I have, at the end of the day, a sort of toolkit that I can reach into and I can pluck out whatever I need and use that. So I'm wondering uh, with the presenting a a trilogy to harper collins and you turned in your first book um yeah. did did you have to have the other the other ideas for the two follow-on yeah. books solid yeah. when you turn yeah. that in yeah i had that and and so how how much how much have you planned forward because you said you you could take this very this, this whole universe you could take it several yeah. different ways yeah. and so go I, off I on different I plan to scale up like I, I essentially what's going to happen in the second book that's outside of the protagonist's control. And there's that. And and I said, here's what's going to happen. And here are the protagonists. And the book is all about how these guys react. That's true. And number three is, of course, the war. You have these British tin soldiers, which are essentially 60 foot walking dreadnoughts going up against uh, the Chinese Zerg rush because they prefer lots more people in power armor. And that's going to essentially be that. And that's, that's, uh, I sketched out the background. I sketched out the armies, the tactics that they use. Uh, I sketched out the protagonists and that's it. Like I didn't exactly say, here's exactly what's going to happen in chapter this, this, and this, here's how this guy's best friend dies. None of that, just the backgrounds and the characters, but I made those as detailed as possible. And now, uh, and now obviously you're working with an editor from Harbor Carlin's on the first book. Yeah. Can you, can you tell, tell, tell us a little bit about the, that, that process if you can about uh and i'm sure that you did had an editing process on number cast too is it is there a difference between the two and and well, kind of talk about that longer. it takes a lot longer uh because their process is every editor is assigned to i mean they may be handling six books this year they may be handling 12 books this year uh and sometimes they will work as well so there's a process of you sort of writing that and then they might get back to you in like three months <laughs> uh, that that's really the primary difference because when you're indie, you have you have a certain constant speed in that relationship. Other than that, it's very much the same. Where they both uh, where they look at the structure and go, uh, okay, here's here's kind of what I feel. Uh, what should be what what should go wrong here? Here's what's right. Here's where the pain kind of breaks down, and there they it's very much the same process. So how many editors? How many editors? Uh, at Harper. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Editors, as in at Harper. Oh, oh, oh yeah, at Harper. Yeah, these, sometimes more than one. I've heard in traditional publishing. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes more than one. But I, but I've been assigned to. Well, I actually have two editors. Uh, but one works on the nonfiction stuff, and the other one works on fiction stuff. Cool. <clears throat> do you are do you know when the the first book is expected to release? Yeah, November. Um, the first of the HarperCollins, uh, the Commonwealth Empires, will be out in November, and so will Number Cast. And there is the suggestion of pitching it as a TV series, and I've sort of sold off my uh, film rights already for about eighty five percent there, and said, okay, go ahead and pitch it. Uh, let's see if that works out. Yeah, there you go. That's very Netflix, cool. Here we come. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's awesome. I, 
it's very cool because there's so many more possibilities now for series than there were for TV series than there were, yep. Yep. you know, five to f- 10 years ago. Because now you've got the big pay for services like HBO and stars, but you've got Amazon prime and Netflix. Yep. And honestly, I don't know that I've, I've seen a bad Netflix or Amazon prime series. They, they really right. know what they're doing. So right. and, uh, and I actually, there's more between them for good content. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. And, and honestly, I've, I've, I'm, I actually prefer, uh watching those to like some of the major motion pictures that are coming out now because a lot of the yeah. major a lot of the movies that are coming out now i don't i don't know you, you're either getting horrible remakes or um yeah not really well thought out plot and structure yeah, movies, and, movies by yeah. committee yeah, yeah. exactly I so mean, it, sometimes, sometimes don't you like look at those movies and go those scripts uh, you could have, you could rewrite that stuff in in a yes. day, and they would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do that a lot. rely far too much on special effects because there was not good enough special effects, you know, twenty years ago. And yeah, it's like if the special effects are good, people will watch it. We yeah. don't even care. What well, I think Josh had it on too. The whole movie by committee thing, because I mean, you yeah. get the accountants and you get fifteen producers, and you, you know, it's just. At some point, the the original vision that the artist had in mind, the director or whoever, it just gets diluted and chopped up. And, and you know, it, I don't think a movie really looks like what it starts out as anymore, no ever. Way. Yeah. No way. yeah, and uh, I think Richard was talking about the new Pacific Rim movie uh, on his right. it, And he had yep. deconstructed it perfectly. And he pointed out that this doesn't feel like one because it's a story. It feels like four stories that are lumped together. And then he had checked the credits at the back of the movie and four people credit. Yeah. Yeah, four writers. Yeah. Exactly what it feels like. Designed by a committee. Yeah. Well, with, uh, with what they did with uh, Altered Carbon on Netflix uh, just recently, you could, you could see definitely the possibilities with your, your uh, Commonwealth Empire series, you know, lining up with the same kind of cyberpunk feel uh, that Alt- Altered Carbon did. That'd be awesome. I think it's awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I don't know anybody, but if I did, I'd call him and tell yeah, him to call him right take now. your. <laughs> okay, can can you pick up his stuff? Because it's really nice. Uh, what do you normally? So you uh, you you only write average one day a week. Uh, you said, and and you work uh, at your day job most of the time. So do you, do you have a lot of time that you spend reading, or or how do you uh, how do you ingest your fiction? Audio, Kindle, uh, hardback. What do you I like? Read. I read. Yeah. I read. Uh, I have like I have a strict target of read at least seventy books a year, and so far I've been hitting that. Um, audio books kind of piss me off. Uh, <laughs> I love audio. Yeah. I'm I'm intrigued by that. Why 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 do they piss you off? It's a very weird thing because uh, someone gave me a reading test once, and it turns out I read slightly above a thousand words a minute, and audio books. You know, people speak at about what two hundred words a minute. Yep. And part of me is just, just you know, it just keeps on saying, just get on with it, get on with it. I want to know the rest of it because I would have, re- I would have finished that book by now. Right. <laughs> I can see that. You know, I actually, uh, we had uh, Luke Daniels on the show. Was it Luke when yeah. we had him on the show? Yeah. And I told him that I said a lot of the times I'll listen to books at like one and a quarter or one and a, one and a half speeds. Yeah. yeah, so I can I, so I can get it through it faster. Yeah. He did not like that at all. He, he he said he said I spent all that time. You're ruining my that. art. You're, right. gonna, you're gonna fast. He's basically you're fast forwarding through his work. And I'm like, ah, my bad. So someone out there, really good voice of artist, is just yelling at us, and screaming in his sleep. Right, right. Well, hopefully uh, we have uh, some some feelers out to Michael Kramer to try to get him on the show. He's one of my favorite uh, audio book readers. So. Hopefully that'll work out. Uh, what are you reading right now? These days I'm reading a lot of nonfiction. Uh, I've actually been reading up on so some of the studies that have been done uh, in my field because, like I said, I'm writing that nonfiction book on big data. So I've been studying what's been done in the past, what can be done in the future, so on and so forth. Uh, I've also been reading, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, Okay, it's a book called Star Stuff. Ah, uh, oh, yes. It's a good book. And I finished Was that, that Ira somebody, right? Star yes, Stuff. Ira, Ira Heinchen, I think. Yeah. I, yeah, 
it's a it's a really fun book it's a it's a good romp and he has these little touches of world building that go okay that make you go okay this guy has really thought this world out uh i've also been reading some of the nebula award winner anthologies so i've been reading ted chiang and ted chiang is brilliant really have you have you tried his stuff i have not so ted chiang is a short story writer who works as a technical documentation writer uh with his first short story i think is published in 98 or 96 if i'm not mistaken he won the nebula okay I got and you. the three body problem yeah he, he uh, no that was season loop oh, that's okay. uh, three body problem dark frost theory and that's and that was season loop okay. and tetching is you have to read have you watched uh, a movie called arrival is that arrival? the one with uh with uh, charlie sheen from back in the 90s Oh, no, no, no. Uh, arrival! No, 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 arrival. The one with uh, um, oh, what's with, your name? With the Mc... the redhead, uh, the redhead from Superman and, and Hawkeye. Yeah, and Hawkeye. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, Jeremy. Lois Lane and Hawkeye. Yes, Lois Lane and Hawkeye. Yeah, yeah, and it's primarily a linguistic problem. Like it's 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 very intelligent sci-fi, and that's one of Ted Chiang's stories. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, that yeah. Was, I I enjoyed that thoroughly. That was that was a good that story. So oh, yeah, I really like the uh, the the kind of a future past time travel loop. Yes, uh, yes. that and, made and the that made the movie. That's based on again. I'm not sure how you uh, pronounce this first name, but I think it's called the the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, where they postulate that uh, language essentially shapes how you think. Uh, so, for example, the Chinese word for uh, their land, any any person land like a backyard is, is China, basically. Our, it means our land, right? Uh, and you you have certain, and they draw certain uh, similarities between, for example, the Jewish word for heaven and Zion, uh, and and they say, well, this is these language constructs essentially shape how these people think, and you can sort of see this. Uh, across racial divisions, across uh, countries, across geopolitics, and so on. And so he's basically taken this theory and drawn it out to its extreme limits and said, what if space and time are also a construct of the way languages are, we, our human languages are constructed? Which is brilliant. Yeah, that's trippy. Because it, it opens up a lot of possibilities depending on yeah. depending on syntax and, and how you, you know, because some words in English don't, appear in any other language so it's yeah that's, yeah it's a very cool yeah i like that a lot yeah so ted Cheng is that kind of guy where you read it where he takes like two or three years to write a short story and then you read that story and you see it's winning the hugo it's winning the nebula and you read that thing and you go ha huh. and you just sort of uh, put that down and go okay i can see a lot of ideas from this thing <laughs> no, very see, those that i'm inspired by this uh, <laughs> those are the the stories that I really like are the ones that that you read and you're like, man, I I don't even know what to do now. You just sit there and you're like, right, yeah, right. Resonance of a story right. well told. Uh, another oh. guy is Jeff Vandermeer. Um, I don't know if you watched Annihilation the movie. I'm, I'm listening. To, I'm listening to the audio book. I haven't watched the movie yet, but I'm listening right. to the audio book. It's uh, the books like the Southern Reach trilogy is kind of. I know it felt very weird for me, but uh, embedded in that thing are concepts that uh, you know make you stop and go, "Ah ha, right, that's that's gold right there, that's gold." And he keeps hitting right. gold every time like clockwork. It's a you know it's crazy to me the the amount of everybody thinks everybody says that every every story has already been written. I I but I don't believe that at all because there's so many. Awesome concept theory uh, stories that come out that are super high yeah. concept that you, you're like, man, that's such a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah. And uh, I, I I love the stories that that find the smallest things like you're talking about, like the smallest things yeah. about written language and then affecting the perception of what's going on. That's such a, an awesome concept. Right. That, that's a hook. That's you know that that's just not being taken before. Yeah, and I right. think as 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 especially in science fiction, as as we learn more and we discover more and we we you know we expand our knowledge of different scientific topics, that's going to open up new possibilities for people to go. Well, what if? 
you know, so up to this point, maybe we've told a lot of the basic stories that can be told, but the, the potential is as broad as the potential of what we can discover, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You might like, if you do like high concept stuff, you might, you'd either like it or hate it. Uh, this short story I recently wrote called Omega Point, where I was thinking about Hypothetically, if, if a, I'm an atheist, um, so but if a god exists, if a god-like entity exists, how would he go about constructing the world? And I thought, okay, creating it planet by planet kind of seems micromanaging. So you'd rather write an algorithm to generate a universe, which we've already done. Games like uh, No Man's Sky have already achieved that to a certain extent. And so this god writes a fractal universe into being, and the universe expands. It goes through the standard the Planck phase, it goes through the earliest habitable epoch, and the science is, is true to form. The stars form, all of that happens. And this God is, and I, I was thinking about if, again, if there was God, what would it be like to be God? And what, how lonely it would be to know that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the, the only thing like you in the entire universe. So this right. God wants someone to talk to. And he nudges life as he sees it's like silicon life things that crawl and creep and so on he's nudging this towards civilization uh because he knows that once these civilizations start interacting and you know sort of expanding beyond the first two card shape levels you st sort of start seeing a creature that kind of acts uh, like a god itself once you can harness the energy once civilization harnesses the energy of an entire galaxy it is already close to godhood or something so close as to make no difference. And this, interestingly, is a theory put forth by Thielhard uh, in the 1800s, uh, a Jesuit priest uh, from, from the Catholic Church. He tried to merge uh, creationism and evolution together. And he said, look, life against all odds works against entropy. Everything else is going towards gray goo, but life evolves in complexity. So it is not unreasonable to assume that the Earth's biosphere eventually will reach a point of complexity where it is God against something so close as to make no difference. And he said that God lies not in our past, but in our future. So I took that, I took the card shape scales, and I took the physics of how the universe came to be, and I had God literally creating other gods talk to me. And that, that, that stuff is fun. And that's called the Omega Point? Yeah, it's, it's literally called the Omega Point. But you'll either like it or hate it. Well, in a lot out. of ways, though, that harkens back to the old polytheistic religions that we call mythology now. You know, Zeus and Thor yeah. and these guys, you had the one big god, and he basically yep. gets lonely, so he goes and knocks up some willing maiden and creates all the demigods just so he can Absolutely. have somebody to hang out with, you know. it's Absolutely. You know, and like uh, that kind of the cosmic egg is a, appears in so many religions. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, so you can lift that. And if you, a cosmic egg would technically be a spherical universe. So your omega value in, in, in relativity would be slightly greater than one. You could make that work. The, the physics are fairly straightforward. Well, well, I just picked up a mega point. I'm going to add it to my uh, Ooh, my you. list. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll let you know whether I loved it or hated it. <laughs> uh, it's, probably in a room. it's one of those things where I'm glad that I have a foot in the Indino because I can try crazy stuff like that. I don't expect a publisher would ever go within 10 miles of this piece. Right. Uh, well, we are coming up to the uh, the end of the hour for the interview. And uh, as always, it's been a fantastic show. And, and, and uh, it was really, really uh, enjoyable talking with you and, and uh, learning all about you. Um, where can uh, our viewers and uh, audience find out more about you and your books and when you can, ex and you said it was coming out in November this year for the, the yeah. first come on. It's so uh, go ahead. Yeah. Where, what's your, web, what's your website? Where can people track you down? Yeah, at? So if, if people can spell it, it's <laughs> that first part. It's it, it's spelled just like it sounds, and it'll be uh, it, 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 it'll be in the it'll be in the show notes. Actually, I think it already is in the show notes of the video. Uh, it's but on the plus side, I do get all the unique email addresses. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. I see. Yeah, because you could do all the at tags, and nobody has that name. That's very good. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, very nice. Uh, well, uh, everybody that came out and hung out with us during the live show, thank you guys for coming and hanging out and being a part of the show this Monday morning. Always uh, rowdy and uh, shenanigan-filled mayhem in the live chat. Uh, if you're watching on the feed later and haven't participated in the live chat, come check us out on Monday mornings um, and see what all the shenanigans are about. Um, next week, we have Jonathan Brazzy who is a military science fiction author and a retired Marine. Uh, we met him at 20 books to Vegas yep. 17. He'll be there uh, this year as well. Uh, I haven't heard whether he uh, got elected to a directorship or not on uh, science fiction writers uh, of America, but he was, okay. he was up for directorship. Yeah. He's, he's uh, going for it. Oh, well, that's brilliant. Uh, I, yeah. I read his book, which is uh, which was shortlisted for the nebulas. It was brilliant. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he'll be up on the 30th, and then uh, we've got uh, several other uh, authors lined up, Joshua James, Matt Heron, um, and uh, several others uh, lined up uh, this month and next month. I think everybody will enjoy them. Uh, but Yuna, thanks uh, thanks so much for coming and hanging out with us on, on our Monday morning, your Monday night. Next, it's, it's Tuesday for you now. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. Oh, and still hot. Uh, it's still hot. It's still 98 degrees. It's still 98 degrees. It's still hot. It's still melting, and I'm going to open a window now. <laughs> this is a. I think this is a, a first for our show where um, it's the the it's time travel. So we're in Monday, and you're in Tuesday now. So we're talking back and forth through time. We're talking to on, the uh, future. That's right. <laughs> We're talking to the that's white right. fountain of the world wormholes there. So that's right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, everybody. Well, uh, we will see you next week. Uh, come back, hang out with us. We're going to talk about some reading. We're going to talk about some writing. And, of course, everything in between right here on Keystroke Medium. Later, see guys. You.